This is the SS American Victory World War II ship and museums. That morning we left the Silver Dollar Resort and headed to downtown Tampa and the docks. The area was touristy and there was a lot of traffic. If you go there, make sure you get the free parking at the ship right on the dock. Don't pay to park in the parking lots when you're coming in because they're very expensive. Just drive through the gate and park right next to the ship on the dock. This is American Victory, a merchant ship. This has all been restored and it, they say it still can get underway. Uh, I think they sail it twice a year or something like that. Yeah, I'd just like to be stuck on one of those for a couple weeks. This is where all the gunners lived? Yeah, th this was Navy only during mm -hmm. World War II. Uh, during Korea and Vietnam, you know, uh, when the engines are running on the ship, it's like 120 degrees down here in the engine room. It's very warm. And inside the house, it's very warm. During Korea and Vietnam, there was no Navy on board, so the crew members came down and took this compartment over to get away from the heat. Oh, yeah. They had a lot of fans, but that was, it was still warm. There was no AC. Yeah. Um, those are Navy racks, or pipe racks. Uh, you got a mattress with us, you got a pillow, blanket, a life jacket. The lines on there, you had to keep the lines very tight so you didn't sag down. The term sleep tight comes from that style of bed. Oh, okay. It goes back to the time of Shakespeare, it's not a Navy thing. Hmm. Now in the morning, they're on hook, so they'd be hanging straight down. So they had room to sit around, read or write, but the racks and the bulkheads would be left up for the guys who had to work overnight. So they'd get some sack time in. Now if you're down here sleeping at nighttime, the two guns had to be manned 24 hours a day, so a quarter more hours on the guns. So 18 are in here sleeping. You have to watch that night. The messenger would come down, say you had to go and watch it at uh, two in the morning. He'd come down, locate you, poke you with his flashlight, wake you up. He'd get dressed, go find the man you had to relieve. He'd come down, get undressed, and get to the same bed you just got out of. That's called hot bunny. Yeah. When it came time, out here in the passageway, the first room over there, it says gunnery officer. He slept in there with two petty officers. Those are merchant seamen bunks in the Vietnam. Everything is from Korea and Vietnam there. These were from World War II. The middle room is the head. There were two showers and two toilets for the 27 guys. And the room over here says uh, Gunner's Pantry. They sent them back coffee and donuts and stuff. But when it came time to eat the regular meals, they went down to the cruise mess and ate with everybody else. Mm -hmm. Now, in World War II, there was a total of 82 people on here. Victory ships were designed to have a crew of 62, but according to our historian and the records he found, there were 55 merchant seamen and 27 Navy for a total of 82. Um, they had eaten 30 minute shifts because the cruise mess is pretty small. Did you look in there already? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Notice the tables, they had the raised edges on there? Yeah. Those are called fiddles. That was to keep your plate on the table because the ship would always be rolling. And the corners were all cut off, so it didn't spill, it just ran out onto the deck. <laughs> now, if they were still serving a meal and it was rough weather, they'd probably put a wet tablecloth down on the table and you put your plate on that and that way it wouldn't slide around on you. Oh, okay. Um, now, they had, they had three regular meals a day down there breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but they also had another meal at midnight. It was called Midnight Rations. mid rats they called it. That was for the guys who had to work overnight. Yeah. It, it might be leftovers, but usually it was like a grilled cheese sandwich, hamburger, something like that. Um, now, the merchant guys, uh, they were civilian. You know, when the war broke out, we didn't have enough ships, so the government paid to have these ships built. They owned them. They would contract with the merchant company to provide a crew to run it. And like I said, in World War II, you had to have a Navy detachment on board for the submarine threat. But during Korea and Vietnam, the guns were not on board, and there was no Navy. They didn't need them. Uh, the crew sizes then were 35 to 44, depending on what the mission was. Now, this ship, when she was, she was commissioned on June 20, 1945. Mm -hmm. And there was only, at that time, we didn't know it at the time, but there was only two and a half months left of World War II. But when she was built in the California shipyards in Los Angeles, uh, uh, she was uh, commissioned on June 20. Okinawa was still being fought in the Pacific. She left LA, went up to Long Beach to be loaded up for the invasion of Japan. And they loaded up three ships with identical cargoes in case they lost any of them. But when she left the States on July 5th of 45, she steamed straight across the Pacific all by herself, no convoy or anything, until she got over to the Philippines. Then she went into what they call a zigzag. Um, it was uh, more of a submarine threat there then. 
and she stopped in Leyte in the Philippines to pick up her routing orders, and then she went up to Manila Bay to await the call up for the invasion of Japan. And, and I'm sure you know, in the island fighting, as they worked their way across the Pacific, the enemy wasn't surrendering. And Okinawa was the straw that broke the camel's back for us, and we took very heavy losses there. So they realized then that if we had to invade the island of Japan, it was going to extend the war up to another two years. And they estimated Allied troop loss to be nearly a million men. That's why they dropped the atom bombs, and the war quickly saved more of our lives. So this ship is in Manila Bay, bombs are dropped, war's over, but we still had to maintain our bases. So she stayed over there, mostly in China and India. She came back to the States in February of 46 and went up to New York. She picked up a load of cargo. She had to, be, she had to replenish four military bases down south, so she took a run down to uh, Trinidad, Rio de Janeiro, Buenos Aires, and Montevideo, returned back to New York, picked up another, another load of cargo, and went over to the Mediterranean. She made several stops there. Her last stop there was um, Alexandria, Egypt. Then she went down through the Suez Canal, down to Bombay, India, and uh, Colombo and Ceylon. And then she returned back to the States in New York. And for the remainder of 46 through 47, she sailed mostly New York to Europe under the Marshall Plan for the rebuilding of Europe. There was 16 or 17 countries civilian damage we helped rebuild it. But in 1948, she wasn't needed anymore. So when they brought her back, they put her in fleet reserve, or what they call mothballs. They put her on the Hudson River above New York City. She sat there for three years. They brought her out in 1951 for Korea. She served in Korea 51 to 54. In 54, she wasn't needed anymore, so when they brought her back, they put her in fleet reserve, this time over on the Sabian River in Texas. She sat there for 12 years. They brought her up in 1966 for Vietnam. She served Vietnam 66 through 69. She actually, she actually left Vietnam on November 30, I believe, of 69, came back to the States for the final time, and they put her in mock balls up on the uh, James River in Virginia. And you'll, you'll like this story. Uh, you know, after Vietnam, we were down to three reserve <coughs> fleets. The reserve fleets held hundreds of ships. What they do is they put, they put them side by side, real close, and they'd seal them up and dehumidify them and cut down the rusty corrosion but they just sit there floating until it needed again. So in 1985, you know, with the introduction of the atom bomb, no more world wars. 1985, Congress was looking to cut budgets. They looked at our reserve fleets and they said, why are we keeping all these ships? I think you're good and they still be used. So in 1985, the American victory and the Hattiesburg victory were brought up. The government spent two and a half million dollars to get the American victory up and running again. The same cost, the cost of building the Rizzi back in 1945. They sailed for 26 hours. They said, yep, she works. And they put it right back in mothballs, and that's where she sat in 1998, yeah. she was going to be sold for scrap, and that's when we get a hold of it. The ship has been around the world twice, been through the Panama Canal 18 times, the Suez Canal three times. Um, she's been through a couple of typhoons and a hurricane as well. When she was in Okinawa, a, a typhoon came up, and uh, she put the sea to ride it out, and according to the clinometer in the, uh, in the, sh in the ship's records, she registered an 85 degree roll in that storm. 85 degrees is like, uh, it's like looking at 12 on the clock and going almost down to 3. So like if you're sitting down, you're facing the deck. No, it, was, it, was, it was a pretty That's bad storm, yeah. Now that first voyage when she was loaded up in the invasion of Japan, until the time she returned back to the States, she was gone 236 <coughs> days on that first voyage. She sailed 35,756 nautical miles on that one trip. <coughs> She's had a total of 28 voyages in her lifetime, and she logged a little over 500,000 nautical miles of sailing. And, and out of those 28 voyages. Um, you know, there were merchant seamen that ran the ship. Um, there was civilian. Um, if you had never been to sea and you reported on board in, as a merchant marine, you signed on as an ordinary seaman or an OS. Your duties were restricted to the main deck and inside the house only. After six months or so, if you thought you learned enough and you wanted to get a pay raise, you took the test for AB, or able seaman, able-bodied seaman, they call them. Those are the guys who worked the lofts, did watches the loft, worked the cargo down below and everything else. Um, an ordinary seaman in World War II was equivalent to a seaman first class, or an E3. The able-bodied seaman was equivalent to a second class petty officer, or an E5. The guy that ran the ship, he was a master. He had the equivalent rank of a Navy captain. The chief mate on board was equivalent to an executive officer on a Navy ship, or the XO they call it. And then your other mates were lower ranked officers. Um, now, the Merchant Marine, they had the highest casualty rate of any group in World War II. They lost one in 26. The Marine Corps lost one in 34. Ratio-wise, there were a lot more Marines than there were Merchant Seamen. Uh, Merchant Seamen, I, they had 243,000 Merchant Seamen in World War II. In the Marine Corps, I've seen two figures for the Marines, 669,000 or 699,000. Both those figures came from the same book that I looked at, but they were different editions, so I don't know why the numbers <laughs> changed. <laughs>
Um, now you're on, on board, you have to abandon ship. You get to the same lifeboats with the Navy guys. Once the Mercer Seaman stepped off the ship and into the lifeboat, he was no longer paid. He was only paid for his sailing time. If he ended up in a prisoner of war camp, unlike the Navy, no back pay, no GI Bill, nothing like that. Um, the benefits that the Mercer Seaman had in World War II, you got a dollar a week if you were hospitalized. You got $5 a week if you ended up in a prisoner of war camp. 663 of them did, including four women. Um, they got $100 if they were ever shipwrecked, but they had to have proof. Not that the ship went down, but they were on the crew list. And hmm. the family got $125 burial expense. Uh, this is what we're doing. Do you have any idea what the minimum wage was in World War II? I'd say 60 cents. Mm. Oh, way high, way, way high. 30 cents an hour. And it was frozen during the war years. Uh, and that was, that was before they took out income tax. Now, an uh, ordinary seaman in World War II was paid $82.50 a month. The able-bodied seaman got $97.50 a month. And they also had a quartermaster. He got $112.50 a month. Um, oh, my goodness. Uh, you're on, say you come back and you pick up more cargo. You come into a big harbor, let's say Norfolk. There'll be dozens that shipped at anchor waiting to be called up to the piers to be loaded up. The first thing the captain would do is call ahead and find out what his place in line was going to be. If it was going to be more than a couple of weeks, the company was uh, not going to pay these guys. So they sent them ashore and unpaid leave. Um, the old timers, they didn't care. They could sit around, play cards, drink or whatever. But if you're a young guy and had a family, you needed a paycheck. So you'd report to the local hall. When you went in the hall, they used to have these huge slate boards up there. Every ship in port would be listed up there. If they needed any crew members, that would be up there as well. Now uh, the young guy sits down, goes up and down the list. Goes, Whoa, American Victory's going out next week. And there's an or they, they can use an ordinary seaman. He'd ask if anybody had sailed on it. The two most frequently asked questions usually were, what's the captain like and what's the food like? <laughs> Other than that, he was all set to go. But he still had to go back to his captain. If he wasn't critical to the ship's crew, he was allowed to go. Because the whole purpose was to get the ships loaded and either as quickly as possible. Now, if he was an officer on board, a mate, or if he was somebody really senior in the division, chances are they weren't going to let him go unless they knew they had somebody close by that could get to replace him. But that thing about where you had to have proof if you were shipwrecked, that's where the problem came in. Because a lot of times when that guy was allowed to leave for another ship, that paperwork sometimes got lost or never got caught up to him in time or anything, you know, something like that. It was, it was pretty interesting the way they did that stuff. Mm. I, I would say the Merchant Marine kept terrible records, but uh, you know, if it, once the Navy had them, uh, better records were kept. Even on this ship's history here, a lot of the stops that this ship made, weren't re we couldn't find records of it, but the Navy kept their own logs, and we found a lot of the stops in the Navy records as well. And that's how we managed to build so, up our history book. So they didn't keep day-to-day uh, -day logs like they do now? Oh, the Navy would. Well, I mean, yeah. Merchant Marines? Well, no, when you're out at sea, it's just, you know, it's just uh, another day at sea, good weather, whatever. Oh, yeah. And the, the only time, when you came into port, that's when you would actually start logging stuff in. Because you, you had to... <laughs> keep track of how much cargo you dropped off or whatever you took on or whatever, you know. Okay. Um, now this ship, uh, this is a victory ship. These, these were built in the latter part of the war, um, uh, 44 to 45. From February 44 to the end of the war, they built 534 of these. When this ship, when the American Victory was launched in, uh, I think it was May 24, 45, she was the 442nd victory ship uh, launched. Now, from the middle of May to the signing of the Japanese surrender September 2nd, just in that two and a half, three month period, uh, went from the 442 to the 534. And now this ship, this ship is uh, named after American University of Washington, D.C. The, the way they named the ships, we'll, we'll do the Liberty ships first. The, the first Liberty ship was called the Patrick Henry. And because of his give me liberty or give me death, that's why they called them Liberty ships. And they named them after heroes, important people. Thanks for coming along for the ride, as down the road we go. As always, if you enjoyed this video and want to see more of our adventures while on the road, make sure you subscribe and click the little bell to get notified when a new video comes out.